If you were to ask someone to describe their bedroom, I can almost guarantee to you that their answer would be something along the lines, well, it's small. I have a bed, a side table, my closet is across from my desk, and I have a cabinet of books and thingamajigs next to my door. That's about it. While you may have an idea of their room, vaguely, they didn't express the whole picture. From what they gave you, you're not able to imagine their bedroom, you're able to imagine a bedroom. For instance, they didn't mention their bookshelf. You couldn't visualize this enormous bookshelf filled with their favorite selections from their adolescence, books from their short-lived sci-fi rom romantic zombie apocalyptic phase, and literature from their current passion for the American romantic classics. You don't have the slightest idea about their string of Polaroid photos revealing their most special memories, the comforting humming from the air vent situated right above their bed, and the faint scent of vanilla which often resonates within the covers of their worn bed. The heap of untouched, dirty clothes that mysteriously continues to grow in the right corner by the dead bug, or their beloved art history calendar pinned up right above their desk, which currently boasted a masterpiece from the European Renaissance. Ultimately, what they did not do was express any power of observation. Now, I write. I need to make use of my power of observation. Without it, I would have nothing I could possibly write about. Yes, I'm a writer. I use my words. Yet, I also use what I see. A writer's goal in any piece of work is to write what we see in such a manner that you see what we see exactly how we see it. But in order for that to happen, it's essential that a writer exercises their own eye for detail. Any scent, sight, feeling, taste, or sound one may deem irrelevant inevitably works its way into how the reader experiences a writer's work. I traveled to New York City last summer. I'd been waiting for this moment for three years, more or less. Stepped off the plane, got in my luggage, and anxiously awaited for the car to pull up and take me into the city the city of which I believed I was in love with. Seconds after stepping outside the airport, and I could already sense it, the almost tangible amount of opportunity. The air was fresher. Yes, I said fresher. Everything was exhilaratingly new to me. The crowds were quicker, messier, shouts were louder, winds crisper. My breathing increased heavily, partly out of my excitement and nervousness. I was in New York City. I was in New York City. The car screeches inches beside my sneakers, wobbling on the edge of the curb, and we were off. New Yorkers have no time to waste. Triborough Bridge took us right into Harlem. Our final destination was Barnard College on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. I was subject to undergo a week-long writing course there titled Place in the Personal Essay. The route to Barnard was regretfully disappointing. I had guilelessly acquired the false assumption that New York City was Fifth Avenue's poshness copied repeatedly throughout the island. This belief did not stem out of hope, but from my sheer lack of knowledge and experience. I grew up watching Gossip Girl's Blair Waldorf and Serena Vanderwoods and gallivant through the glamorous Upper East Side of Manhattan, six maybe more shopping bags in hand. I had wholeheartedly and naively adopted their privileged reality as my idea of New York City. The city, the one I fell in love with, was essentially a city I had never observed for myself, but let someone else do the observing for me. So I couldn't help but be completely disarranged when introduced to Harlem and its exhausted, weary personality. I studied the fatigued buildings, furrowing my eyebrows. This was not an action of any sort of revulsion, but as an immediate response to my vulnerability towards the city. My eyes obediently followed a torn piece of paper, which perhaps boasted a restaurant menu or band concert float across the empty sidewalks, skim against the colorless trees, pass by the graffiti-stained walls with their paint eroding off, my heart sank. This is what I'd been waiting for? Where were the glossy, crisp streets? You know, the ones with the decadent, towering designer stores amidst the mad frenzy of honking yellow taxi cabs in the perfect jungle of New Yorkers and a mass of dirty tourists, which I'd seen on Gossip Girl, Sex in the City, and Breakfast at Tiffany's. Well, I admit it now. I was lazy. I didn't deem it necessary to learn about the neighborhoods of Manhattan and their contrasting personalities. Nevertheless, I hold everlasting devotion in my heart for the city. I felt immense guilt over my uncertainty in the moment. I want to make this clear. My confusion came from realizing I carried a false assumption from a fictional character's observation. I was trying to capture a complete, honest account of my observations and emotions connected to that, because that is how I, an artist, create. Now, try and imagine a world where every single person was utterly oblivious to their surroundings. 
that would be embarrassingly boring, even dangerous for that matter. I recently saw an episode of the National Geographic interactive reality series titled Brain Games. This episode, called Pay Attention, demonstrated just how we humans are awful observers today. We're distracted terribly easy and are generally not willing to critically evaluate the world we live in. It's important we realize this flaw because observation is really key for human survival. While it certainly may not seem like it in this day and age, for a multitude of years, our ancestors had no option but to strictly examine the world around them and the people in it solely for their survival. All of their senses were put to use in order to understand their environment. Just like an animal's alerting shrill could warn others, humans use these techniques of observation as well. Our ancestors could sense the relation between one's sweat and who's in an area or what they may have eaten. Even posture, arm swing, weapons, and water vessels could signal our ancestors if there was danger ahead. So what's happened to this need for observation? Well, generations evolving and settling to cities allowed for close proximity. This changed how we viewed and needed one another. Being so close, humans had less time and even genuine desire to see what was around them. We began to interact first instead of later, contrary to what we used to do in the past, while also gaining a sensitivity to being observed, which happens to explain why we can feel uncomfortable being, when being stared at now. Let's not forget about the important role and the power that observation holds, especially today when we see distracted drivers, uninterested individuals, and people who have put politeness over their senses. Not only is observation required by writers, any artist out there, or occupation for that matter, but for your own human survival. We can't let ourselves succumb to the laziness of using, of using others' opinions, perspectives, and realities to formulate our own. Please realize exactly how powerful not just observation is, but your own observation is. To see really is to believe. To see for yourself, to be curious, inquisitive, creative, whatever it is. While being observant might not determine our next meal like it did for our ancestors, it certainly does open doors for us, which could lead to amazing newfound things. We have to open our eyes because that will eventually open our minds. <laughs>